Hello everyone, this video is going to be a crash course on MongoDB and it's refreshed for 2020 so if you're just getting started now it's going to be especially relevant. Uh, in terms of the content of the video or what to expect from this video, I'm going to start out by talking a little bit about what MongoDB and NoSQL are in general and then we're going to go and set up a MongoDB database using MongoDB's cloud-based solution or cloud-based hosting provider called Atlas. And then from there, we're going to connect to that database, perform some basic operations on it, so you can get a handle on how it works from the user perspective. Uh, so first, let's talk about what MongoDB is. Um, so it's a NoSQL database that was created in approximately 2009. And if you're just getting familiar with NoSQL, uh, it's a little bit different than your traditional SQL. In your traditional SQL, you store your data in columns and you have constraints on those columns. So say for instance, you have to say this column is gonna be a varchar, this column is gonna be a integer, this one's gonna be a Boolean, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, with NoSQL database engines, you don't need to worry about any of that. So it's an unstructured language. And as opposed to storing your data in tables, you store your data in things called documents. And the equivalent of a table in Mongo is a thing called a collection. Um, so that's just a little bit about NoSQL in general. Uh, part of the reason that folks really like using it is that it can scale really, really well. Uh, it scales horizontally as opposed to vertically. And if you don't know what that is, I have a video on horizontal versus vertical scaling, which I'll put in the description section below. You can check that out for a more thorough discussion. Now, in terms of uh, who's using it or why it's so popular, now there's a couple of different stacks that are very, very common these days, particularly in the web development community. There's the uh, mean stack, which stands for Mongo, Express.js, AngularJS, and Node. Um, there's also the MERN stack, which is the same thing. You just swap out Angular with React. And then there's a third one, which includes Vue.js, so probably M-E-V-N. Um, now, I think the reason that it's so popular and used in all these different stacks is, well, there's many different reasons, but I think the main ones are uh, flexibility. So with MongoDB and NoSQL in general, you get a lot of flexibility into the schema. So you don't need to define your columns or your types in advance. You can just get started very quickly and start inserting and manipulating documents without defining the schema of those documents. So folks seem to really love that it's very flexible. You can do whatever you want with the types. Uh, you can get started very, very quickly. Um, and the second reason from a usability perspective, this is something that I've noticed, especially having lots of experience with other NoSQL engines, is the fact that the language itself is very customer focused. Uh, it's very intuitive. You don't need to read the documentation too much to get started and start building a, a very rich database with some very rich functionality um, using your queries. So that, that's another reason that I think it's very popular. It's very easy to get started, very easy to use. Um, the syntax does things that you would expect. You don't need to read the documentation too much. Uh, so that's another reason that I think it's very, very popular these days. So that's enough about me blabbering on. Let's actually get into the second step now, which is to set up a MongoDB database on MongoDB's uh, cloud solution called Atlas. So here I am on the MongoDB website. I believe it's just mongodb.com. And I'm just gonna click on the start free button here. And this is gonna bring us to the kind of wizard to get started. So we need to register an account. So company is optional. So I'm gonna use my email here. Um, and put that in and put in your first name and your last name and your password of course and we're going to click on i agree to the terms of service and privacy policy and go ahead and click on get started for free uh, sometimes this can take a minute or kind of a couple seconds so it looks like it's doing something so that's good news for us uh, welcome hello yes Let's let this kind of close out here. Okay, so the first decision that we have to make is what type of cluster that we wanna set up. Uh, so clusters are just um, many hosts in a environment that are gonna be running your database. So this is that horizontal scaling concept that I was talking about earlier. Uh, if we scroll down a little bit here, we can see there's different pricing tiers between the three. Uh, so the first one is a shared cluster. This is mainly meant for you just messing around, getting started. Uh, it's absolutely free, so you don't need to worry about any costs that come out of this. You get all the good stuff, so highly available, end-to-end -end encryption, uh, access control. So for anyone that's just getting started, wants to try out MongoDB for the first time, uh, obviously you wanna use your shared cluster. If you're looking at more of a production use case, then you wanna use dedicated clusters. So that'll have your own hardware, auto-scaling functionality, everything like that. 
And then um, if you want to take it to a next level, so you want high availability, you'll be looking at multi-region clusters, which have uh, versions of your database that are set up in multiple availability zones, uh, which are different data centers spread across the world. But in our case, we want to do just some testing, just some sandboxing to see how this stuff works. So we're going to go ahead and click on create a cluster under the shared clusters section. So I'm going to click on create cluster now. And at this point, we need to decide which provider we want to use. So you have three options, AWS, Google, or Microsoft Azure. I'm just gonna use the defaults here, um, AWS and US East One. Pick the region that's appropriate for you. As far as I can tell, there's no difference um, except for just picking the one that has the uh, closest data center to you. Uh, scrolling down here, the cluster tier, this kind of lets you define um, what type of hardware that you want. We want all the free stuff here, so I'm not going to go through the minutia of setting all the, the particular options here. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and skip all this and go directly to creating cluster at the bottom right here. Going to click on that guy. And this often takes a few minutes here. We can see on the right, it takes between one and three minutes. So I'm going to fast forward this and come back when it's all done. I'll be right back. Alrighty, so here we are after everything has been created after a few minutes of waiting. Uh, so there's a couple steps that we need to do here. We can obviously see that this is our cluster that we just set up. Uh, we have a couple different options that are going on here. So it's telling us just a summary of our database. And this uh, graph section here will show you kind of the read and write operations, the number of connections that get established to it, uh, the size of your cluster, everything that goes on in terms of what's happening inside your cluster. You can get a, a quick snapshot of what's happening. Um, so we need to do a couple things in order to connect to this database. And that's our next step, if you recall. So I'm going to go ahead and click on connect here. It's going to bring up a next screen. Scroll down a little bit so you can see everything. So just kind of off on a tangent here, the reason I really like Mongo, especially with Atlas, is they make this really easy. They have a really nice wizard here that just guides you through the process and holds your hand. So let's do this now. So the first thing we need to do is whitelist a connection IP address. I'm going to click this button. It says my IP. I'm going to click add. Okay, wizard is is going. All right, that, that's nice. Let's minimize that. Uh, then we're going to create a MongoDB user. Um, so let's just call myself AWS Simplified. And I'll set a password here. And then click on Create User. Sure, save. Go away, please. Um, all right, please stop. <laughs> and now I'm going to click on Choose a Connection Method. Um, so what we're going to be doing in this video is I'm going to be using a tool called IntelliJ Data Grip to connect to my uh, cluster just because it's a very intuitive tool, gives you autocomplete on all your um, syntax. So if you're interested, you can go and check out that tool. But for this demo, I'll show you how to set it up using the Mongo shell, which is um, if you ever use like Python, for instance, there's a Python interactive shell. This is similar in terms of Mongo. You can just kind of get started really quickly and start doing things directly in the shell and get immediate feedback as to whether things uh, were, are working correctly or not. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Mongo shell here. Uh, so there's a couple different options. There's the Windows or Mac or Linux. There's a whole bunch of different things here. Uh, so if you're using Mac, what you want to do is just go ahead and download Homebrew. You can do so by visiting the link uh, in the description section here. Uh, click on copy and then just go to your terminal and run this guy. This should set up the shell for you. Uh, and then you can kind of go on to the next step on the later part of this video, which is where I kind of uh, perform all the operations. Now, if you're on Windows, it's slightly different. Uh, what you need to do is download this program. Um, it's a zip file, and what you'll need to do is unzip that file, and then take note of the directory in which you're unzipping that file. And then you need to open up a command prompt or PowerShell terminal CD over to that directory where this was unzipped. And then you can just type in Mongo and that'll get your Mongo shell started for you. And then you'll be ready to go. Now, assuming you've done all that either on Mac, Windows or Linux or whatever you're using, uh, you're going to need this section down here regardless. So this is just the connection URL. Um, which you'll, you'll have to modify a little bit. You can see DB name here. Uh, we don't have a DB name yet. Um, and your username will no doubt be something different than mine. Um, when you're first setting this up, you set your DB name to whatever you want your initial DB to be. Um, so mine could just be called test or, or prod or whatever you want here. So when I uh, set this up in data grip, um, I'm going to be swapping out this name and then I'm going to be keeping out 
keeping my um, username here. So once you're in the shell, you want to copy this command and change the correct things respectively. So the DB name and the username, and then just run this command by pressing enter. So I'm going to go ahead and set this up now in data grip, which is where I'm going to be performing my queries. And I'll come back once that's all set up. All right, guys, here we are in data grip now, and this is just the tool that I'm going to be using to interact with MongoDB. Um, if you're on Mac or Windows and you followed my previous instructions, then you're just using the shell. Um, but you're going to be using all the exact commands that I'm showing you right now. And by the way, I'm going to be making all these commands available on um, my GitHub, and I'll put a link to those in the description section below. So you can kind of keep a, a sheet with you just in case you want to come back to this a little bit later. Um, so now that we're here, uh, I've connected to the database successfully, so that's great. Uh, so the first thing that we want to do is just show the databases to see what is here. And there's a couple that uh, come by default. We see that we have an admin and local that are created by default. Um, so we need to create our own now. So let's do that. And the way that we do that is just we say use and then whatever you want. So mine is going to be called the transactions database. Um, so now we can see here that we switched to the database transactions. So that's good. Let's move on to the next step. And the next thing that we want to do is actually create a collection, which is in SQL land, it's uh, the equivalent of a table. So what we want to do is run the command db.createCollection. And you can actually see, this is why I like using data grip so much. It gives you this autocomplete very nicely. So it tells you exactly what uh, is coming up. It's kind of like a, an IDE for uh, MongoDB. It also supports other languages as well. So maybe check that out. Uh, so we're going to say create collection and, and I'm just going to call my um, collection the same thing as my database itself. So just call it transactions and then I'm going to run this guy. Um, so that was successful as per the check mark there. Um, so that's it for the setup. Now let's run through some basic um, operations. So the first one is just called um, a find. So db.transactions.find. And what this will do is show you everything that's in your database. If I run this right now, um, there's nothing in here yet. So you're just going to get an empty result set back. Um, so now let's fix that. Let's go ahead and start inserting some data into the table. So the command that we're going to be using is called db.transactions.insert and open and closed. And then there's some arguments that we need to pass in to the body of this request. And this is where we specify in JSON type language uh, what we want this document to look like. Um, so we can say maybe we want an ID field and maybe that's just an integer. And then we want a type of transaction. Maybe that's, um, oops, maybe that's gonna be a purchase type. And we probably want an amount. So let's say like $50 or something like that. Um, and then we can say things like item IDs and we can have an array here. So uh, maybe there's a couple different items. So 001, 002. And then uh, maybe we want to store a more complex object within this document. So let's say we want to store details about the customer. We can say customer, open, close brackets, and then add details about the customer. So maybe their name is um, John Doe. And uh, maybe we have something like their address here. So one, two, three, fake street or something like that. Um, so this just kind of shows you what the insert uh, syntax looks like. And it's very intuitive, very easy. You can see um, the data types. We don't need to specify anything other than what the data types are in JSON language. So, you know, your integers, you don't have the, the open and close quotes around them, obviously. You can actually have uh, Booleans. Let me add that as well, just to show you. Uh, so maybe like if they're a premium customer, um, you can say true or false. And you can see that this IDE is picking up on the type. So it knows that it's a Boolean. So it's uh, recognizing that and it knows that this is a string. So it's recognizing that knows that this is an array, knows that this is an integer. So you get all that that neat stuff as part of using an IDE here. Um, so just scrolling down, let's run this guy and we should be able to see. Uh, so it successfully ran. Now let's just run the find again to see everything in the database again and see if it shows up. Now, can we make this a bit? I don't think we can make this bigger, but we can scroll through here to just show you what's happening. Uh, so we see the amount, we see the customer, everything that we kind of specified earlier, um, the ID, the item IDs, the Boolean is represented by a checkbox here and whether or not it's a purchase 
or not. So that's kind of getting started uh, in terms of what it looks like to insert documents. Now you can actually do, um, there's a second operation called insert many, um, and it looks something like this. So you go insert many, and then you just pass in an array of these guys. So in my case, I would need to put the open and close on this down here. And then you can just pass in a second object here. Um, so you can do a couple different um, items all in one shot. So I'm not gonna be doing that in this demo. You can play with that on your own, um, but that's what you would do if you want to uh, insert many in one shot. So let me just erase everything. I wanna copy this to my clipboard because I'm gonna be running that a lot. Um, so that that's how you insert documents. Um, now, how do we kind of find a document by, by some criteria? So let's say, uh, db.transactions.find, that's the command that you use to find uh, records, and we wanna pass in the uh, criteria of what we're looking for. Um, so for this document, we're looking for the one, let's say we wanna find the one that has the amount 50. So we would just say amount and 50. And now all we have to do is run this guy, and this shows you the document that was returned back to you. Now, let's say if we wanna change this to 60, I only have one document that's in this database right now, so this should return no results. Let's just test that, and we can see here that we have no results. Uh, so that's how you do basic find operations to find items based on your criteria. Uh, keep in mind, if you want these to perform really well, you're gonna to wanna to add indexes on these uh, columns or types that you want to query on often. Um, so if you have a very large table, maybe you want to add an index on the amount um, field so that you can search very quickly for it. Not gonna show you how to do that here, but something that you can kind of research on your own. So that about covers it for creating and reading, just some basic stuff here. Uh, now let's show how we can update a particular uh, field from within this object. So say for instance, we wanna change the type of this, this guy that we inserted from uh, purchase to refund. Maybe we made a mistake and we wanna update that. Uh, so let's see how we can do that. So we can say db.transactions.update and we want to use the one where the amount was 50 or you can specify any criteria that you want here. And so we need to pass in a bunch of different things. Oops, erase that. Um, so there's three kind of um, arguments that you need to pass in. The first is the query criteria. The second is the update criteria that you want to perform. And the third is just some optional parameter that you can pass in. Um, so this is the criteria for the query. So let's write the criteria for the update now. So comma here, open and close bracket, and we're gonna find the query criteria now. Um, so it needs some special notation. So we're gonna say dollar sign set and then colon, and then now we define what parameter, what field that we wanna change. So we wanna change the uh, type field to go from uh, purchase, which is what it's originally, and now we want it to be refund. Um, so what you get by using this set syntax as opposed to just kind of specifying the type and the value is that using this set annotation, you don't kind of blow away the rest of the document. Um, so looking at this document, if you just did this without using set, you would just kind of nuke the whole document. So all you would have left is just the type and its uh, value would be purchase. But we just want to change this. We don't want to get rid of all this stuff. Um, so by using the set notation, that's the functionality that we get. Um, so let's run this guy. And that was successful, that's great. And let's just find this row again. I gotta change this back to 50 since that's what we're looking for. And we should see here now that it changed from purchase to refund. And you can see that now, purchase to refund. Um, so that's great in terms of how you perform updates. Um, there's an optional parameter here called upsert. And there's a whole bunch of different parameters that can go into the, the third um, argument. But if you set it to upsert, if, for instance, this doesn't exist, there's no criteria that matches. So say, for instance, I change this to 60 now. If I rerun this, um, this update, what you'll find is, actually, let me, let me do the find. Oops, that's not what I want. I want db.transactions.find. What we'll see now um, is what, what happened here. Um, so because I used upsert, none of the other columns were present. So the only thing that'll get updated are, is the thing that I was looking for. So the amount being 60 and everything else is blank except for the type, which is refund. Um, so that was the only thing that we provided. So keep in mind, that's an option. Um, you can, th this basically says, if it doesn't exist, create it. That's what upsert means. 
Um, now, how do we remove documents? So it's, it's a similar story. So you just say db.transactions.remove. And then you again, you just pass in the query. So amount um, is 50 in my case. And if I run this guy and then I rerun the find command, I should only see the one that has 60 in there, which is the one that got left over. So I hope this video has been useful for helping you through how to set up MongoDB and just set up some basic operations and perform them. Uh, if you like this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. And also check out this one on the right here on NoSQL versus SQL, where I talk about the difference between those two technologies in depth. Uh, thanks so much folks for watching and I'll see you next time.